Okay, Ben, please stop eating chips. We got a show to do. Oh, it's so good, man. You put a little cheese and avocado on it. Oh, what kind of chips are they? Just like tortilla chips? Uh, no, they're like rye. You know, I don't know what they're called. Melba toast or something. By Mel the way. Melba toast. Not to change the subject or anything, but uh, folks, if you could see young Dr. D right now, he shaved <laughs> that beard. He's got a mustache. I'm like, is that Burt Reynolds? Is that a young Burt Reynolds producing my show now? No, just tell me. You what? Just me. <laughs> I tell you what. He's looking good, ladies and gentlemen. He's yeah. looking. The only guy in the in the country who's looking better at the uh, in the middle of the pandemic than he was at the start of the pandemic. The young doctor from Alton, Illinois, Doctor D. Man, that was so nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I have a mustache only. You look good, dude. I look like the Pringles guy. All right, your Ben Jarofsky show. Four. <laughs> Wait, who do you look like? The Pringles guy. Oh, the guy in the commercial. <laughs> your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, January 14th is moments away. But before we do this, we need to thank our sponsors. Sponsors like SEIU Healthcare, Illinois, Indiana. The Chicago Federation of Labor are also sponsors as well as couldn't do it without the Chicago Reader. ChicagoReader.com. Subscribe. All right, you have a song of the day, Ben. Uh -oh. You have two songs of the day, but I really Ooh. want to hear Frank's request. I'm sorry, Kathy. Uh, I mean, I say I do, but do I? I don't know. Wait, what was uh, Kathy's request? Highway to Hell. Oh, I, we, we used to do that song. Highway <laughs> oh. to Hell. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> uh, for 10 trivia points, name the group. Oh, come on. ACDC. That's Very it. Very good. So Did you ever see that video of, like, the stadium filled with people doing Highway to Hell? Yeah. It's pretty I, it, No, come on. Don't act like, yeah, but I saw that, of course. Yeah. I've seen and it before. the world. <laughs> it's a pretty cool video, anyway. Anyway, what's Frank's request? <laughs> oh, two. All right. Uh, Freeway of Love by Aretha Franklin. We're looking on the freeway, Woo! and then uh, isn't that the one where uh, uh, the sax player Clarence comes in? Woo! That's the saxophone. Clarence? <laughs> uh, forget it. It's a Bruce Springsteen reference. You wouldn't get it. You uh, should. Who's the sax player for Jimmy Buff Buffett? Then you would understand. The Ben Jarofsky <laughs> Show starts now. It is Thursday, January 14th. <laughs> What's so funny? I can't. You just look like 20 years young. You look like a kid. And live from my apartment in his attic, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're Wait, that's not the intro one. yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Stay on the program. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's just edit that out for the podcast. President of the Chicago Principals Association, Troy LaRavier. <laughs> and now your host, and I'm surprised that's never happened before. <laughs> Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Dennis. Looks like he's 16 Thursday, and here's why. No, that's not really what we're going to uh, uh, edit that out on the podcast, right? Uh, we're calling this Cancel Culture Thursday, and here's why. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have a bit of a confession to make. I was all set to open with a screed about the unabashed hypocrisy of Republicans who claim they're being canceled while they're on a national stage complaining of being canceled. Begging the question, uh, how are you going to say your TV show has been canceled when you're still running on primetime TV? Excellent question. I was going to ask that question. But then I opened my tribute and saw that Rex Hupke, columnist, columnist Rex Hupke, wrote about the same thing. And as Alec Jones might say, damn you, Hupke. It was old Rex Hupke. It entered my brain last night when I was thinking about what I was going to say. And just think about that for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Rex Hupke. Rummaging around my brain. Oh, my God, he says. Here's a box filled with tapes of Bulls playoffs games from the 1990s. And here's the greatest hits of Jay and the Techniques. Apples, peaches, pumpkin pie. And why is there a Raquel Welch poster on the wall? Anyway, enough with the speculation about what's in my brain. But it's true. 
Reading Rex Huffke write about the exact same thing I was going to write about left me with two options. One, I could pretend that Rex Huffke never wrote it. It's an old journalistic trick. Just pretend that the thought was yours and yours alone and like the rest of the world does not exist. By the way, this is the second time this has happened with me in a Tribune columnist. If you recall, Eric Zorn did the same thing on another issue, which I can't remember, a while back. And I just remember saying, damn you, Zorn, as Alex Jones might say. My second option is I can embrace it, go with it. So I'll go with option two. It'd be like Mayor LaGuardia reading the funnies during the Depression, and then little orphan Annie said, Daddy, we're bucks. But in this case, I'll be reading Rex Hupke. It's pretty funny stuff, this Rex Hupke wrote. He presents this guy calling technical support to complain that he recently... <laughs> Sorry, it is pretty funny. He recently subscribed to cancel culture, but none of the people he asked to be canceled show any signs of being canceled. Damn, it's pretty clever. Why didn't I think of that, D? You know why? Because I'm spending too much time watching old Bulls games from the 1990s. That's why. I mean, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Burt Reynolds. I loved you. I loved you. In Deliverance, you were unbelievable. In Del- oh, no, that's not Burt Reynolds. It's Dennis. Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, the guy looks like he's 16. Can I just say, <laughs> we're carding you. All right? Me with the mustache threw you off your game there a bit there on that <laughs> intro, <funny>. huh? <laughs> yeah. I can't lie, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he's doing weird things now. Looks like a young porn star. Not okay. an old porn star. <laughs> it's not what I'm going for you. <laughs> no, man, it just threw me off. It's true. Dude, what if I just, like, you turned on the camera and, and I had a full beard? And you'd be like, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? I know. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah, it's Rex Hupke. Man, that's hard to say like 10 times. Rex Hupke, Rex Hupke, Rex Hupke, Rex Hupke. Hey, you did it. Didn't sound that hard. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dennis, I'm a professional at this. I don't know if you know this, but I've been in the game of radio for four years now. <laughs> All right, yes, leave, go. Where was I? Oh, yes, Rex Hupke, great column. It's pretty funny. He uh, he starts off with, oh, among the many Republicans complaining about being canceled is Jim Jordan, a uh, congressman from Ohio, and quoting uh, Hupke. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh. It's crazy, right? He's literally saying only one side is talking. He's literally saying only one side is able to talk while he is talking. That is true. I feel the same way, man. This dude's up there going, only one side is able to talk. Well, how is it that you're talking if only one side is able to talk? <laughs> it's, I agree with you, Hupke. It's so true. And then the other, oh, my God, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I want to shout out to Frank. Frank, thank you for sending me. Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene is the uh, congresswoman uh, from Georgia, uh, the QAnon supporter. And already she's introduced measures or either introduced them literally or talking about introducing uh, <laughs> uh, impeachment to impeach Joe Biden. The guy hasn't even been sworn in yet. She wants to impeach him. Uh, two can play at this game. I'm going to be clever. <laughs> Why don't you just, um, hey, I'll tell you what. Let's cut a deal, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'll, I'll, I'll like, take seriously your effort to impeach Joe Biden even before he's been sworn into office. If you vote to impeach Donnie, how about that? Oh, wait, you already didn't vote to impeach him. Uh, forget about it. Forget about it. Anyway, Marjorie Taylor Greene, quote, uh, from Georgia, the wackadoodle QAnon conspiracy theorist. Yeah, I can see her, see her clear as a bell. This is Rex Hupke writing. And get this, she's wearing a mask with the word censored on it. I know, right? She's blathering about something live on national t- television, but she thinks she's been censored. Yeah, I saw that too. I thought the same damn thing. She's got the censored. Like, nobody has ever censored a Republican from saying anything. I'm trying to think, has a Republican ever been? No, because Donald Trump has been saying the craziest, most fantastical, made-up BS for six years. He got elected president of the United States on it. He's arguably still, I'd say, the second most powerful man in this country. He's got, what, 40% of the Republican Party ready to go off a cliff for him. 
But somehow or other, they're crying about being censored. Anyway, one, well, one more. This one's pretty good. I, one more I'll give from uh, Rex Hupke. Uh, it's Republican Representative Glenn Grothman from Wisconsin. This dude is so white, he makes Wonder Bread look like Pumpernickel. That's a pretty funny line. Although, who am I to say? Since I started doing uh, this show with a camera, I realized I may be the whitest, <laughs> the whitest man in America. Uh, I don't know. Dennis without the beard is right there with me. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> All right, back to uh, Hupke. Can I hear Rec uh, Glenn Grothman? I sure can. Listen to this. He's making excuses for the domestic terrorists who stormed the U.S. Capitol. Quote, they're scared to death that nobody else would will fight the cancel culture as we head toward an era when some things can't be said. Wow. I mean, that quote is really, he, it's bonkers, right? It's like white privilege had a baby with entitlement and sent it to the University of Zero Consequences. It's very true, very on target. And that's the thing about Republicans, ladies and gentlemen. They always feel like they're the victims. They always feel like they're uh, being picked on. And mostly they're just reciting from the same old playbook. It's like Jimmy Durkin down in Springfield, the leader of the Republicans uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, DuPage County's own, Jim Durkin. And uh, we'll get to him a little later, uh, I think, when we get to the news, uh, but uh, he's still <laughs> he's still going on, Jimmy Durkin, about Mad Dog, Michael Joseph Vatican. Michael Joseph Vatican, of course, uh, was ousted as speaker, uh, and uh, but that hasn't stopped Jimmy Durkin for going on and on about Mad Dog. You know what? I'm thinking about it, Dave. If anybody should be complaining about being canceled, it's Michael Joseph Madigan, as in he was canceled, but no one's defending him. I don't see uh, Jim Jordan with a Michael Joseph Madigan t-shirt on. I don't see uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene with a Michael Joseph Madigan face mask. Do you see that, D? Uh-uh. You know what? Where I was, where was I on that whole bus thing? I think now that everybody's thrown Madigan under the bus, I'm going to get off the bus and be with Madigan. The bus bet's <laughs> over. We left you, dude. We're long gone, pal. <laughs> We can't do the bus routine anymore. Oh, damn it. <laughs> anyway, Republicans invested a lot of time and energy in getting other Republicans to see themselves as the underdog. They see themselves as defenders of liberty who are being canceled by the mob, even though the only liberty they've ever defended is one for themselves, and the only mob of any consequence is the MAGA one that assaulted the Capitol on behalf of Donnie Trump. Come on, MAGA, time to cancel, cancel, culture, refrain, and come up with something new. We got a great show today, today everybody. Woo! Uh, our guests will be Dennis's mustache uh, and... Okay. <laughs> Never Sorry, shaving guys. again. <laughs> no, dude, I like it. I like the look. Uh, and Troy Robier, who's president of the Principals Association. Yes, Troy will be here. Uh at two o'clock. Let's hope all the technical aspects work out well. I don't know why they wouldn't. <laughs> don't jinx it. <laughs> yeah, don't jinx it. Uh, and if Troy can't make it for the because the technical aspects, well, aspects why are we even uh, assuming this is going to happen? It works Dennis fine every I, day. Dennis and I will sing a song. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, plenty of political discussion ahead with Troy Laravia. Before we get to that, the young man from Alton, the man they call Doctor D, with the news. Hey guys. Oh, and Ben, if you bring up my mustache one more time, don't ask me for shit for the next three months, all right? I'm, I've been canceled. All mustache talk has been canceled. Officially canceled. <clears throat> Sorry, Bert Reynolds, go ahead. I mean, Dennis, go ahead. <laughs> Let's find out what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. We begin in Chicago and we begin once again with our coverage on Chicago schools in the year 2021. Remember, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot and her Chicago Public Schools team want students and teachers to return to the classroom. And no, you haven't missed any breaking news. Still living in a pandemic. <laughs> the Chicago yeah. Teachers Union, they're, they're encouraging their teachers to not return until CPS can promise to provide a safer work environment. Teachers who have refused to return have been kicked off their online remote learning account 
And here we are to today's news. And the following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times in the Dear Issa. A second staff member at McCutcheon Elementary has tested positive for the coronavirus days after a colleague tested positive Friday. A cluster of COVID-19 cases at an uptown elementary school has forced eight people, including the principal and assistant principal, into quarantine during the first week that students are back in classrooms since March. A second staff member at McCutcheon Elementary has tested positive for the coronavirus after a colleague tested positive Friday. The school's two cases were confirmed well within a 14-day period and, quote, could potentially be related, meeting the criteria for a cluster. A CPS spokeswoman said in a statement that while the districts cannot rule out the possibility that these cases were acquired in the community outside of school, <laughs> officials, officials also, quote, cannot rule out the possibility of in-school transmission. The acknowledgement is notable because this appears to be the first case district-wide that CPS representatives are suggesting may have been transmitted in a school. Oh my goodness, where to start with this one? Uh, I'm just telling you guys this, C uh, CPS spokespeople, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Janice Jackson, oh, and all your friends and supporters, you're starting to sound a little like uh, MAGA when it came to Herman Cain. I'm just saying guys, I'm, I, I, we, Dennis and I have been talking about the COVID now since March. So we've had a lot of practice, a lot of news items about the COVID. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm calling it the COVID. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The COVID. You sound like my uncle or something. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, uh, we'll take care of that on the uh, podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so you're starting to sound like Republicans. That's how Republicans do. Like Herman Cain came down uh, with COVID-19 and ended up dying. Uh, after he was uh, at that, uh, God, that ill-fated, disastrous Donald Trump rally in Tulsa. Remember that one? And um, so uh, after, in the aftermath, you know, and let me remind you that Herman Cain was not wearing a mask at that uh, rally. And in the aftermath, all the Republicans say, we don't know if he got it at that rally. Stop blaming the rally. Instead of like thinking to themselves, you know, my dear friend Herman Cain died. Might be a good idea to rethink our whole cavalier attitude toward the pandemic, our whole hostile attitude toward masks, which still exists. All the Congress people during uh, last week's insurrection went into hiding with the Democrats. All those Republican Congress people wouldn't wear masks. <laughs> and now what, three or four Republicans come down, uh, excuse me, three or four representatives have come down with COVID? Think there's a connection? Maybe. Now here we are in the city of Chicago and for whatever reason, well, I think I know the reason, it's a political one, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Janice Jackson have insisted that the teachers get back in that school and those kids get back in that school, regardless of the pandemic. So now there's, you know, seems like there's like a, a outbreak at this one school. And what are you doing? You're, you're reading from the book of MAGA. Well, you know, we can't say for certain that these uh, teachers uh, ca contracted the disease from uh, being in the school. <laughs> you know, it's a very complicated situation, and they could have gotten it anywhere. All, all over the map on this one. Lori Lightfoot and Janice Jackson, you're all over the map. And vaccines are supposedly just around the corner. You couldn't just wait. Couldn't just wait till the teachers got the vaccine. No, got to teach a lesson to that Chicago Teachers Union. Got to let them know what it's all about. And this thing where they lock out teachers, I'll say it one more time. By the way, D, I bumped into an old friend of the show who will be returning. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Sam Holloway. Oh, and nice. Remember, yeah, Sam's a great guy. He's one of my uh, leftiest friends. Uh, people, see, right, people, right wing and centrist, they don't realize like what a real lefty is. I've, I've noticed this. You know what I mean? Like they think like liberals are lefties. I'm like, um, obviously you've not been around a lot of lefties in your life. Anyway, uh, Sam, a dear friend, is probably the most radical guy I know. And true to form, he told me, yes, he did not vote for Joe Biden in this election. <laughs> Gotta give him credit, D, okay? His freak flag is still flying. He's going to come back on the show. Cool. Uh, and uh, so I just said, Sam, what's your thoughts on reopening the schools? We were, yeah, it was late at night. I was walking. He was walking his dog. We were socially distanced. He just want you to know that, okay? We're like 15 feet apart. And he goes, it's clearly 
a ploy uh, to bust the Chicago Teachers Union. And I was like, yes, the skies opened up. It was like a moment where great minds think alike. Sam Holloway, you're so right. It's clearly a ploy to bust the Teachers Union. Why else would you proclaim that the reason you're opening the schools is to make sure that children get the education they need and then in the same maneuver block teachers who are not reporting back to school from access to their children so there's not all the kids are in the classroom some are doing remote learning but to teach so dastardly teachers who won't go in the classroom a lesson board of education lori lightfoot janice jackson will not allow them access to the computers they need to do, to lead the remote learning. Uh, that'll show those teachers. And what about the kids? Oh, well, hell with the kids. The kids need to realize that their tools are a greater, a greater mission. And that mission is destroy the teachers union. So that's what's going on, D. You know it as well as I do. And Sam Holloway, he saw it. We're going to bring Sam Holloway back Good. to the show in about a week or so. And I'm glad we got Sam Holloway on at this time. Uh, I've learned uh, when you have him on, uh, I don't know, during an election, a lot of people aren't that happy with him. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, remember, we, we, was that back at the uh, the radio station yeah, yeah. in the old days? WCU Later. Yeah, WCU Later. And uh, Sam came on. Man, were they mad at me. <laughs> You know, we were doing a list the other day. I think it was uh, Mark Sims. <laughs> the reasons Ben got fired. I think Sam might be uh, somewhere on that list. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Let him let, tell him that. Tell him that. <laughs> oh, I tell him that all the time. <laughs> I love the man dearly. <laughs> Yo, Sam, you're the reason I got fired. He goes, ah, Ben, you didn't need that job. Right, let's anyway. just say uh, he doesn't <laughs> vote blue no matter who, you know. I don't think he ever votes blue. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, he's a real true blue uh, radical. Not a whole lot of them in this country. And uh, but he saw right through it. He's a really wise man. I don't agree with him on every single issue, and he knows it. But he's a really smart guy. He saw right through it. He's going to block teachers' access to remote learning. The only possible objective to that is to crush that union. Oh, you think you're so big, big shot, huh? Well, we'll show you who runs this city. Get back in that classroom. And hey, you know, I know it's not uh, the popular thing to do when you're an elected leader, but uh, I don't know. We all make mistakes. Maybe we could just admit this was kind of a bad idea, right? <laughs> right? I'm, you know, D, but you know what, Mayor Lightfoot, you admitted it took a couple days uh, that maybe the city hadn't handled the uh, Anjanette Young police raid. Yeah, maybe hadn't handled that one all that well. Next thing you know, you're, uh, you said you weren't going to talk about it. Then all of a sudden, you couldn't stop talking about it. Uh, first, you said there was no reason to apologize. And then you were apologizing. Why don't you do the same thing with the teachers union? You know, just go, you know what? Uh, maybe it wasn't the greatest idea. Blame it on, hey, you know how you blamed Engineer Young and the lawyer? The guy, <laughs> what's old boy's name, Flesner? Just find someone at City Hall to blame <laughs> this on. Yeah. Just find some doctor. Uh, I didn't want to do it, but this doctor... This, oh my God, what terrible advice this doctor gave me. You are fired, doctor. I am taking your car. And everybody be like, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> well, not the Tribune. The Tribune is like foaming at the mouth. <sighs> Get that teacher's union. <laughs> they hate the teacher's union. Don't understand hey, that. No, go ahead. No, Rotter in Florida. Yeah. Hey, Lori. Uh, uh, Come out. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> it's that part of the Republican Party that unites with the centrist part of the Democratic Party in their hatred of the Chicago Teachers Union. Oh, well, go Gators. <laughs> you think Rodgers rooting for the Gators since he moved down to Florida? Oh, you're damn skippy. You're damn skippy? What yeah, that's what Mustache Dennis says. <laughs> okay. Hey, wait a minute. I thought we're not supposed to make any references to that mustache. <laughs> Did anybody ever tell you you look a little like Clark Gable from Gone with the Wind? Just say it with that new mustache. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's move on. Today, the mayor was at Daily College at 9.15 a.m. for an update on COVID-19. I will try to provide updates on that after our interview with Troy LaRavier, if or when they become available. When I was a kid, I loved the Batman TV show. Whatever you say, man. <laughs> Wait, what? 
What was that about? I can't. I, why was she saying that? Uh, the Census Cowboy was coming to town and oh my God, reminded her of Batman, cowboy, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good memory. Good All memory. right, now let's go statewide. President Trump, the first to be impeached twice and only in one term. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> right now, in my mustached face, I have quotes from a handful of our elected leaders here in Illinois. Elected leaders from both sides of the aisle with their thoughts and comments on impeachment number two, just one week away from his exit. And, yeah. you know, to save us all some time, let's be honest, we could sum up the Democrats' reaction in one word. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? Ben? <laughs> So we're only going to read the comments from our elected leaders of the conservative persuasion for this. And to save us even more time, because their statements are so damn long, I will only read the last paragraph. And with that, we only have two quotes to read, Ben. Oh, okay. I'm looking forward to this. Oh. Uh. I know sarcasm when I hear it. First up, first up, it's Republican Representative Rodney Davis. Rodney Davis said on Trump's second impeachment, quote, our nation needs sober minded leaders who will soothe a wounded electorate. President elect Biden has missed an opportunity to act on his promise of unifying the country by calling for calm and pledging to listen to those who feel so ignored by our elected leaders. He was he is now the face of his party and will be the legitimately elected leader of our country in a matter of days. I stand ready to work with President-elect Biden on solutions to the many problems our country faces. We should all wish President Biden success, for when he succeeds, our nation succeeds. Wow, what a bunch of BS. <laughs> you know, I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> I mean, really, Rodney Davis, what a bu Where was all that call for sober-headed leadership or whatever he said when Donnie Trump was like a raging drunk? Six years of making up stuff, putting it out on Twitter, no matter, no matter had not a grain of truth in it, saying Barack Obama was born in Kenya when he was born in Hawaii, trashing John McCain. I mean, you know the whole laundry list. Where were you, Rodney Davis? <laughs> I'm scared. MAGA loves this guy. Now, so, now suddenly, your boy, Donnie Trump, incites a bunch of MAGA hat wearers into ransacking the Capitol. And yes, it's an impeachable act. We all know that. But you're so afraid of MAGA that you don't want to vote to impeach. So what you do, what do you do? You blame it on Biden. <laughs> What, what did Biden do? Biden's, Biden didn't tell the crowd to go ransack the Capitol. Biden didn't tell Donnie Trump to rile up the crowd. And by the way, the stuff that Trump did, the horrendous stuff, impeachable acts, didn't start with riling up the mob. For the last, how long has it been, D? Two months? Donald Trump has been... Uh, Broadcasting this lie that the election was stolen from him, broadcasting a lie that there's some kind, this huge conspiracy to deny him his victory. And by the way, Rodney Davis, Madigan, Michael Joseph Madigan never did anything remotely boss like as Donald Trump calling election officials in Michigan and Georgia and summoning them to the White House legislators from Michigan to try to twist their arms into overturning the sober, to use your word, <laughs> the sober count of all the officials in all these states. And all they did was count the results, proving what we knew already. Everybody knew that Joe Biden was going to trounce Trump. We all knew that. All the Republican operatives knew that. They knew that Donald Trump, he didn't win the last election. He lost it to Hillary Clinton, popular vote I'm talking about. He done nothing in four years to bring Hillary voters over to his side. If, if anything, he had alienated them. He concentrated on the base that elected him. He did that from the moment he was sworn in to the moment he incited that riot. So everybody knew that he was never going to win the popular majority. The only issue was with this crazy electoral college, could he win enough states to get quote unquote reelected? 
Well, it's pretty obvious he didn't. You knew that. You went along with it. And now you're still going along with it. And you're now preaching unity. Wow. That is something else. Preaching unity after you were part of the team that was doing everything it could to destroy any notion of unity for the last four or five years. So that is pretty hypocritical of Rodney Davis, to say the least, Steve. Man, dude, just just say, if you were honest and you said, you know what? Majority of the people in my district are MAGA hat wearing Donald Trump cultists, and it's the end of my career if I uh, vote against to defy them. So, guys, I got to go with the mob. Sorry, I want to get reelected. I could kind of appreciate that. It would be honest, at least. So you're saying don't book Rodney Davis for the show <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> left-leaning uh, politics. Don't book him on the show. Yes, okay. I mean, by the way, that, that's 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 kind of funny. The notion that you would be the guy booking Rodney. Oh, Davis. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dennis, be on the phone all night. I'm trying to book uh, the guest for tomorrow's show. No, I'm not going to be booking Rodney Davis anytime soon. Not, not going to do it, dude. All right, up next. It's Republican Representative Darren. I miss you already, Donald Trump. And no, not Bailey. Darren LaHood. <laughs> oh, God. Darren LaHood's a little I upset. Forget about LaHood. <laughs> As I stated last week, our Constitution is clear in laying out Congress's obligation to count and certify the Electoral College votes. I also mm. believe our Constitution does not envision impeaching a president without an adequate investigation or hearings. Our democratic system is predicated on due process and a thorough review of the underlying facts and evidence. Congress has yet to even receive a full briefing by the appropriate federal authorities on the events that occurred surrounding the riots at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. I oppose impeachment. Pushing articles of impeachment days before the inauguration will only inflame and further divide our country. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, you know, this comment, uh, I mean, until he went back to the inflaming uh, bit, which is such a joke, because uh, once again, uh, just like with Davis, I never recall, I don't recall Darren LaHood ever criticizing Donnie Trump for inflaming stuff. But the first part was classic, like when the Republicans get all lawyer-like. Legally speaking, you know, just being a learned legal scholar. Oh, which lawyer is that that you know? <laughs> Anyone in particular? Didn't sound like Coogan. No, it's Jimmy Coogan. No, it's not JC. Come on now. But they get all legal like and lawyer like and just like, you know, like they've been st up all night reading law by a candlelight, like Abraham Lincoln. Just pouring over the law books. Ooh, well, legally speaking, I don't think I could do this. As opposed to being afraid to. I don't know, LaHood. I think the evidence is pretty clear. Donna gave the speech, said, go to the Capitol, I'll lead you. And they all went to the Capitol. And they ransacked. Uh, they ransacked the halls of Congress, sent all you guys scurrying to the basement where the Republican legislators could poison the Democratic legislators with COVID. So much for unity. Oh, there we go. Hey, LaHood, how about unity in what? Protecting one another from the virus. That would be a nice idea, wouldn't it? Anyway, I don't know. It seems pretty clear cut. D. All of a sudden, everybody is a defense lawyer. That's interesting, you know. <laughs> Everybody's a defense lawyer. I'm sure Darren LaHood was uh, supporting Johnny Cochran when he was offering up his legal ideas about O.J. Simpson's defense. I'll bet you Darren LaHood, well, he's got a point there, you know, Ben. Uh, if the glove uh, don't fit, you must acquit. I'm sure Darren LaHood was saying that back in the 1990s, right, D? You know, but now he's LaHood for the defense. Yeah, I know. It gets a little crazy. Hold, hold on, Mr. LaHood, one second. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> so are you saying book Darren LaHood? I have him on the line here. Should we book him? Yeah, book him, Dano. Book him. Uh, All right, Mr. LaHood, we'll be talking soon. I have your email. Yes, uh, LaHood at Maga.com. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Great. <laughs> so stupid. No, we're going to have a whole show next week. Uh, Darren LaHood will be on the show. Uh, Rodney Davis will be on the show. And Phyllis, you know. 
<laughs> my, you know, Phyllis calls me every day. Ben, when can I come on the show? I yeah, want to talk about she does call times. you every day, and we hear it <laughs> every day. She doesn't really call, ladies and gentlemen. It's just just a joke. I could just, you know, just so everybody knows. <laughs> just had to make that clear. <laughs> Okay, let's move on here. Next up, we're going to talk about Springfield Wait, Phyllis. Get out of here. <laughs> Next up, let's talk about legal reefer. First update. Yes, it's still legal. Recreational cannabis brought in a billion dollars last year. Not going anywhere. No, this update is about that pesky process of obtaining recreational cannabis licenses in Illinois. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times. Rachel Hinton, and yes, he's back at it, people. <laughs> Paging Tommy Two Joints. <laughs> Paging Tommy Two Joints. It's reefer writer Tommy Two Joints Shuba. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Hardest working journalist in the city of Chicago, ladies and gentlemen. Young Tommy Two joins. <laughs> no smoking in the building? No smoking in the building. <laughs> the headline, which is right above a giant picture of our good friend and former Senator Ricky Hollywood Hinden, the headline reads, Bill creating 75 more pot shops dies in Springfield. Yet another failure in bid to diversify white weed industry. A push to create 75 additional cannabis dispensary licenses fell short on Wednesday, further stymieing, love that word, further stymieing state lawmakers' lofty goal of diversifying Illinois overwhelmingly, uh, Illinois' overwhelmingly white weed industry. Though state senators approved the measure earlier Wednesday, their counterparts in the House failed to call it for a vote before the lame duck session ended. State Representative LaShawn Ford, a Chicago Democrat who was part of a legislative working group that contemplated the additional licenses, said the bill fell flat because legislators, quote, failed at the art of compromise. He went on to say, quote, because of that, the state of Illinois continues to lock black people out of an emerging economy, said Ford, who previously said the state's social equity efforts have amounted to, quote, an epic failure. Ford said the major sticking point was the prospect of allowing existing medical dispensaries to relocate without losing their ability to sell recreational weed, something some major pot firms have long been pushing for. Industry insiders have estimated the state is missing out on roughly $100 million in tax revenues by blocking dispensaries from moving. Yeah. Well, uh, What can I say? Uh, this is one of our favorite themes on this show. Uh, Ricky Hendon was on talking about this not too long ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's really outrageous that the state of Illinois, which uh, legalized uh, recreational reefer, can't figure out a way uh, to cut black entrepreneurs in on the game. And it's a huge game. It's a big time game. Uh, it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Everybody's smoking reefer. We're just transferring something from an illicit economy to a quote unquote legal economy, which we can tax. Uh, and uh, there's no stopping it. The city of Chicago is already borrowing against future revenues. So they're spending the money before it even comes in. That's how much addicted we are to reefer, or at least to the proceeds of selling reefer. And it's so funny that uh, we've come this far. They're now essential workers. It was, what, seven or eight years ago, you couldn't find anybody uh, to endorse it. I think it's outrageous, D. I don't know. Part of, I, listening to this gobbledygook, so next, so like there's two, apparently there's two inequities as our legislators see it. One, the inequity that is hampering rich people from getting even richer. And two, it's the inequity uh, that is keeping black people out of this market. And somehow or other, in the minds of our legislators, those are equal inequities. I don't see it, but that's how they see it. So let's take a little while longer. <laughs> let's make sure rich, powerful corporate interests get a greater lock on the reefer game. I don't know, D. Uh-oh. I could get in trouble with this one, so I probably should shut up. Oh, yeah. Let's get Bezos in on this, too. You know, he needs some more money. Why not? Let's find a way to give him some money and some pot, you know? Be yeah. Who let's see. Let's ask it. Will Bezos get a reefer license before Ricky Hendon? I think so. Let's ask Ricky Hendon that. 
Uh, so, by the way, the picture of Ricky is looking very dapper. When is Ricky, he not he looking was, dapper? Well, in that video he did. Uh, well, where, uh, all right. <laughs> uh, but, no, you're looking good, Ricky. And I'm with you 100% on this issue. All right. Well, we do have some breaking news. Uh-oh. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times. And Mitch the Dude, Dudek. <laughs> Hope you like that dick day. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot said today that she's seeking to reopen Chicago's bars and restaurants for indoor service as soon as possible. Mayor Lightfoot said, quote, if we look at the various criteria that the state has set, we are meeting most, if not all, of those. So that's a conversation that I will have with the governor. Easing restrictions on indoor service would provide a safer outlet for people to socialize and possibly cut down on underground parties where attendees do not social distance or wear masks, the mayor said. Uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker's office didn't immediately return a request for comment. We'll pause it there. Oh, man. I'm all over the map on this one. I don't go to bars. Look well, for Ben Drosky's next big podcast. I'm all over the map on this one, by the way. Coming soon, wherever you download uh, podcasts. That's not true. I must have meant what I just said back in the day. It's, so, it's been so long since I've done this. I'd go to many bars to watch Bulls games. But I'm not a big drinker, as Dennis knows. Uh, so it really hurts that the restaurants and the bars have been slammed so hard by the pandemic. I kind of share, who was it that came on the show, D, was talking about uh, uh human beings that like are gonna i forget who it was but somebody very learned i want to give them credit for it because it wasn't my idea but uh, there's going to be like a, a a renaissance like when the pandemic becomes controlled uh when we get the vaccines you're just going to see uh, people pouring out going to clubs you at lollapalooza <laughs> finally so i, I feel for them but I don't know, man. This pandemic going to a bar. I'm not doing it. That's for sure, certain. I take this uh, pandemic very seriously. I think Lori Lightfoot is, you know, she's just sending out a message. She's supported uh, by uh, Sammy Torrey, the restaurant industry. You know, those are her allies. Uh, she's, And then they're, you know, they're watching. I'm sure they're saying, hey, Mayor Lightfoot, you open the schools. You force the teachers to go back. I mean, it's not like no bar. All, I mean, I guess, I guess that's equivalent of if she opens, allows bars and restaurants to be open, uh, bartenders would have to go back to work, you know, lose their jobs, what have you. So she's sort of setting the tone. So they're probably saying, there, hey, if we can open schools, why can't we open bars and restaurants? So this is probably her way to look a little consistent. D, which I can appreciate. I you want to look a little consistent. Meanwhile, this pandemic's not going anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. But let's just try to look a little consistent in the whole force teachers to go back to school thing by saying, yeah, we're thinking about. We're thinking about. We're not. It's not like we're going to do it next week or the week after that. It's not like she's going to uh, command every bar and restaurant. You must open. Well, we have or... one more day of the week left, my friend. <laughs> yeah, she could go that. I can just see the, the, the publicist, you know, the operatives. Hey, Mayor, you want to look consistent on this? I think you should s- say a little something about opening the bars and the restaurants so that you can go look. You know, I tell you what, man, it's, it's my imagination or the people running the city of Chicago, like finding their inner MAGA. Have you noticed that, D? Yeah. Like, next thing you know, they'll be sure they won't be wearing masks. Yeah. Oh, who needs masks? It's exaggerated. Well, wait, Lori beat me to that punch. Remember, she got the haircut without the mask. Remember that one? Sorry, D. That was a while back. Didn't even go there. That was a while back. That was actually uh, involved in our number one story. In our 10 gates of Illinois hell countdown. Mixed message gate. Mixed message gate. <laughs> well, we're still very much in the midst of mixed message gate. That's hard to say. We're still very much in the midst of mixed message. Wow. A lot of M's in there, D. A lot of M's. Was a lot of M's in that one. All right. Uh, the piece goes on here to say Lightfoot also expressed frustration. This was this morning, by the way, during our COVID-19 update. Uh, Lightfoot also expressed frustration with the federal government for not providing Chicago with enough vaccine doses. With about 
38,000 doses received last week, 32,000 this week, and 34,550 expected next week. The mayor said at that rate, Chicago won't be vaccinated for a year and a half, and that is completely unacceptable. Oh, well, but, but still we're going to open bars and restaurants. It's unacceptable that we haven't got the vaccines, but we're still opening bars and restaurants. And it's unacceptable we haven't got the vaccines, but get in that classroom, teachers. And if you get COVID, it's like, hey, who knows where you got it? You could have got it in the subway. You could have got it from that Thanksgiving dinner with grandma. What happened to the Lori Lightfoot and the grandma? Remember that the grandma commercials that she did with the other mayors? Yeah, that was right around Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, that, that was then. This is now. Now it's like party on. <laughs> Pandemic? Schmandemic. <laughs> Yeah, pandemic, schmandemic, all right? Uh, we, I think that's about all uh, for that story here. Uh, I'll try to provide more updates as it becomes available. It's just the right thing to do, even though it's a hard thing to do. Of course, I'll give your love to, to Amy and Viv and Hank. All right, love you, Mom. We'll talk on Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. It uh, gets to me every time, man. I feel it. It's great emotion. In retrospect, who is the more emotive mayor? The <laughs> mayor of Highland Park who said, eat <laughs> frozen cake? <laughs> that was, well, mayor Lori life with that sigh. Yeah, those days are over. Thank God the pandemic's over. Thank God it's we can send teachers back to the classroom. We can open bars and restaurants. I'm really happy, D. I must have missed that story, but apparently, you know, they got <laughs> City Hall's got better sources than I do. Ah, surprise, surprise. All right, now maybe to the top story happening in Illinois. And just like that, Emmanuel Chris Welsh became speaker of the House in Illinois. The news broke during yesterday's show. Here's Welch after it was made official. As the Illinois General Assembly, it's important that we meet the challenges of this moment. How do we do that? How do we meet those challenges? We meet the challenge of the moment by being united, not divided. What are your hopes, Mr. Welch? I hope okay. we can open a new chapter in this great state where we can work together to help families who have lost jobs, access to employment, help, heck, access to the unemployment office and health care. Okay, Chris Welch. Was it my imagination or was some Obama inflections going on there? I find myself doing that, as we all know. Every now and then, I just can't help myself. Um, uh, dude, he sounded nervous as hell, and I would have been too. Like, uh, this is crazy. Um, I'm sure he's up for it. Peanut butter uh, he's cup. A master of the game. Had some of those inflections. I think what it, if you're nervous, you it's like a fallback. So if I'm nervous, I go. Y y y um, uh, Dennis has uh, got a good mustache. Uh, kind of missed the beard, but it's looking pretty good. You know, you just, you take your time, you think about what you're going to say, you smooth it out. There's a reason Barack Obama is one of the greatest politicians I've ever seen. Anyway, uh, best of luck to Chris Welch. Tough job. It's right there. Tough job. I think the man uh, is the guy to do it. This is my advice. Uh, for a while ago, I, I, I don't know why it took him so long to figure this one out. Uh, boss, might be a good idea if you step down. Uh, give it to a trusted... A and here's the other thing. All these people are like, man, D, sometimes political writers are like sports writers. Just follow me on this one, D. Sports writers, whatever is in the news that day is what they'll... It determines what they write. You know what I'm saying? The view. So it could, like, if, like, say, Mitch Trubisky has a great game. Like, ah, what a great quarterback. Look quick at his feet. Completely forgetting, like, a week ago when he had a bad game, the same columnist is, was trashing Trubisky. So it's the same thing with political writers. So political writers criticized Madigan. He didn't uh, 
they, they were saying the same thing about Nancy Pelosi. Uh, he didn't leave a successor. There was nobody that he, he prepared for the job that was obviously going to succeed him. He didn't have, like, what happened uh, to the farm team? You have to develop a farm team so you have a good bench, and you go to your bench when you need it. So, essentially, Chris Welch learned everything about the process of legislating from the maestro, Madigan. He was an ally of Madigan, and when he was the man Madigan turned to, like he felt, okay, I could save face, I'll go to my loyalist who was with me until the very end, and I'll turn it over to him. And what happens when he does that? Oh my God, he's just turning it over to, to a loyalist. How's that new? Wait, which one is it gonna be? You gonna criticize Mad Dog because he didn't have a loyalist that he prepared to succeed him? Or are you going to criticize him for turning it over to the loyalists that he prepared to succeed him? Anyway, Chris Welch, good luck. Good luck dealing with those dastardly Republicans. You're going to need it. And, you know, I can't tell, but you may have lost our non-sports fans when you started talking about farm teams. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're like, oh, I'm just so confused. Team today. of farmers? What are they doing? <laughs> so, we have a new speaker. Madigan's out. That is correct. Mission accomplished, right? Right, Illinois conservatives? <laughs> you know, the dude you've all been yelling about for decades? I'm sick of it! Every year! We give power to one person! He's finally gone. So we're good now, right? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Shout out to Shia Kapos, an Illinois Politico. She did a great job in covering this. Heads turned and some lawmakers booed when House Minority Leader Jim Durkin took his turn to speak uh, once Chris Welch uh, got the speaker gig and leveled anti medigan talking points. Durkin accused the longtime speaker, who remains head of the Illinois Democratic Party, of leaving a legacy that, quote, failed its citizens with unbalanced budgets, broken pension systems, tax increase after tax increase with nothing to show for it. The saying goes, if power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Never heard that in my life. <laughs> no, it's, it's an old saying. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Not a good one. Uh, it's not memeable, you know what I mean? Uh, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle thought Durkin wasn't reading the room. Swearing in events are more about pageantry than politics. When Welch took questions from reporters, yes, it really is history in the making, because Madigan never really talked to reporters. He brushed off Durkin's vitriol, saying, quote, he's so conditioned right now to just fight and punch and do things like that. I hope he will see by my actions that this is a new day, a new opportunity to develop a new relationship in this space. It's hard to just flip the switch when you've just been doing something for so long. So I'll give him a pass today. Oh, well played, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> but will Durkin be able to let it go? The Madigan is the root of all evil storyline is the crown jewel in the GOP message vault and kind of was on the Benjirovsky show for about three months and so much easier than criticizing the national head of their own party for feeding a toxic environment, Phyllis, that helped fuel chaotic and tragic events in Washington. Ah, oh, man. Shia, great job. Shia Kapos. I read that today, D. I was like, yeah. I was like, what is it? Like, everybody's in my brain. The lunatic is in the brain. And my phone's ringing, folks. I have no idea how to turn it off. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I'm going to, you know what? I can't ignore it. All right? I'm going to just deal with it. It's the elephant in the room. Answer it. landline, which I, for some reason, the phone doesn't work. Follow me on this, ladies and gentlemen. Like, if I were to answer it, I could not connect to the phone. And yet it still rings. Now, your first question is, well, Ben, why don't you disconnect the landline? Why don't you call AT&T and disconnect it? Because you're paying for a service that you're not getting. And I would say to that question, excellent question. I'm not going to blame it on my wife. Every night, who's going to call AT&T? And then every day, no one calls AT&T. My anyway. co-worker for the last four years, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Now the phone is trying to leave a message. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, Shia Kapos, excellent job. Uh, 
you really did. I just summed it all up. It's just the absurdity of it all. And uh, and and that last point is a very good one uh, that Shia Couples made about the uh, the difference between Mad Dog and Donnie Trump and how they're leaving office. And let's just pause to think about this. Say what you will about Michael Joseph Madigan. I know many people out there despise the man. I, on the other hand, want to thank him for standing up to Rauner uh, for those four years. But he's left with much more dignity and class than Donald Trump. When Michael Madigan saw that the votes weren't there, he didn't try, he didn't claim cheating. He didn't say the other side was, was like stealing the election. He didn't say the process was rigged. He didn't say he had won when he lost. He essentially made a concession. I've lost. I can't get the 60 votes I need. I'm gonna step aside until somebody else gets it. And it didn't take long until somebody else got it. And then when it was all over, he didn't give a speech uh, decrying his successor. He didn't go to the downtown Springfield and call all the Michael Madigan MAGA wearers, hat wearers to come in and ransack the state house. He allowed the he allowed it all just to play out. Far classier than Donald Trump. Jim Durkin, you're rip, still ripping Madigan. Even though he's left the room, so to speak, not one word about Donnie. That's why I'm, I'm just, I cannot take it with the Republicans anymore. Michael Madigan, Kim Fa, oh my God, Smollett Gate. Made such a big issue about Smollett Gate. A triviality to compare to the stuff Donald Trump does in one day. Not one word about Donald Trump. So yeah, Shia Campos, that was an excellent point uh, that you made about Durkin. Durkin, you gotta let it go, man. Gotta let it go. And you should have been uh, conciliatory. You know, by the way, let's not forget that Jim Durkin had thrown his hat in the ring to be speaker. So on top of everything else, he's a bad sport. He lost. He, I don't know. It was delusional to think that he was going to get any Democrats to join the Republicans to elect him speaker. But he was officially a candidate. He was appealing to them. So the right thing to do, Jim Durkin, when you lose, is to be gracious. Now, I know you've been a Republican for all these years. You've been influenced by Donnie Trump, who's got to be the worst loser I've ever seen, even though he is the worst loser I've ever seen. Think about that one for D. Yeah, whoa. But, uh, yeah, yeah they, listen, here's the point. They've invested eight years into uh, turning Michael Madigan into the boogeyman. Eight years and a lot of money, a lot of Kenny G's money, a lot of Bruce Rauner's money, and it's an effective tool. Thomas Kilbride, the judge from downstate Illinois, can tell you it's an effective tool. All those Democrats who ran downstate, they can tell you it's an effective tool. Uh, so now the issue is, who will be the next boogeyman? You know, Jimmy Durkin is obvious from his speech yesterday, he's still stuck on Mad Dog. It's going to take him a while to figure it out. My guess is they're going to try to go after Pritzker. The way they went after Madigan, all those Pritzker sucks signs throughout the state of Illinois outside of Chicago uh, will probably uh, be a, a sign that there's already an audience for it. Troy LaRavier has joined us. Troy LaRavier has joined us. But I don't know. You guys if, hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. I don't know. Let's just finish this point before we bring the great Troy LaRavier on. I don't I know if it will be as effective. Uh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Troy, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, there you go. Uh, anyway, I don't know if it'll be as effective for the Republicans going after Pritzker as it was going after Madigan because Pritzker will fight back. Do you want to take a break, then bring Troy on? Yeah, let's do a quick sound check. Troy, can you hear us? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we've been hearing you all along. We... All right, perfect, perfect. Uh, yes, indeed. All right, D. All right, we're going to take a quick break here, everybody. That was our local news. Remember, you can find us on social media at Benny J Show, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can always send us an email, Show at gmail.com. Uh, if you want us to read your voicemail on the show, leave your name and where you're from. Very helpful. And also, you can call the Ben Jarofsky Show. It's true. We have a phone number. Is it 773 or 312? No. It's 708. 648-5788. That number again, 708-648-5788. The Ben Jarofsky Show will be right back. We are live from my apartment in Ben's attic.
I want an answer. It's not something you ignore. I think you're 100% full of shit, is what I think. If you think oh, we no want offense, to... No offense, fuck you then. <laughs> Hour number two of your Ben Jarofsky show is brought to you by SEIU Healthcare, Illinois, Indiana, the Chicago Federation of Labor, and the Chicago Reader. Benny J, take it away. Troy LaRavi, president of the Chicago Principals Association, has joined us. Uh, Troy, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure, Ben. Thanks for having me. What's up, D-Nice? Hello, sir. Yeah, he is D-nice. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, Troy. We're going to get to really serious, important issues. But before we do, let's just deal with the triviality. Young Dennis shaved his beard. He's looking very dapper and handsome. Don't you agree? Uh, I didn't see him with the beard. But, yeah, he looks good, man. Oh, thank yeah. <laughs> I got a mustache. I'm, I got your yeah. look going, man. Yes. Uh, you look way better with it. Yes. I miss the beard, man. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it's been a while. Um, all right. Uh, the last time we were on the show, actually, we were having a we had a great conversation about I don't know if you remember this, but uh, hip hop and uh, Ice Cube and uh, Donald Trump, black people for Donald Trump. It was a different universe in many ways than the one that we inhabit now. So let's just deal with the local issues first. Uh, Troy, you're the head of the Chicago Principals Association. We've been talking a lot. Uh, about the decision by Lori Lightfoot uh, to reopen Chicago public schools. I know you've been very critical of it. Uh, first of all, any updates, something we should know, anything we should know, uh, any more COVID outbreaks, anything uh, about what's been happening uh, today or uh, since uh, I've been on the show anyway? Um, there's just the news about the potential outbreak at McCutcheon. I don't know if you guys have talked about that, uh, but that's the latest um school reopening story that I've been made aware of. Have you guys heard about you? Yes, yeah, we talked about that yeah. uh, at a yeah. great deal. I was pointing out uh, at the outset of the show that uh, the more and more I listen to, uh, and this is my words, not Troy LaRavier, so you can feel free to disagree with me, Troy. Uh, the more and more I listen to uh, the people who are running Chicago public schools are speaking for them. They're sounding uh, uh, like uh, the MAGA hat wearers uh, after Herman Cain died of uh, COVID. Right. Uh, remember Herman Cain was at the Trump rally uh, in Tulsa. Tulsa. Yeah, and uh, it, soon thereafter he came out with COVID, he died, and the, tr the response of the Trump people is not to reconsider uh, their opposition to masks or their opposition uh, to uh, uh, closing down Trump rallies. It was to say, well, we don't know if he got it in Tulsa. He could have got it anywhere, uh, which is right. sort of what the public school system is arguing now. Go ahead, Troy. Well, there's another aspect of that, too, and we'll see if it comes to fruition, um, because one of the things that CPS is has a habit of doing is scapegoating principles for their mistakes, scapegoating folks at the local level for things that happen at the local level that are a result of the failure of the district to provide the proper resources at the local level. And then they just say principles, principles will say, you know, that principals ask all kinds of questions. They demand all kinds of resources that the district doesn't provide and then says, just make it happen think of something. And when, when you don't just make it happen, you then get the blame. And so I am, um, unfortunately, I think that that might be in the works here, um, not only at McCutcheon, but anywhere where some, something, something like this goes down, where the district's failure to provide schools with what they need leads to something like what may have happened at McCutcheon. We still don't quite know. And then the district then blames folks at the local level for their district level failures. No, that is an old story uh, in Chicago. Blame somebody else and particularly blame someone else lower down on the totem pole. Uh, right. I'd love to get your reaction uh, to one of the main points uh, that uh, Mayor Lightfoot has made about the need to open public schools. And she said this, this was the main theme of the speech she gave, I think it was last Friday that uh, there's an inequity between uh, kids who go to schools, poor kids, low-income neighborhoods and low-income schools, and their wealthier peers. And the need to open the schools is an attempt uh, to close the gap and to make things more fair. And that's why they're doing it. That's why they're reopening the schools. So your thoughts on that? 
Well, one of my thoughts is one you've probably heard before, but the second is probably one that you haven't. Um, and the first one is obvious. Uh, we can see who benefited uh, from this reopen reopening in terms of those, if you consider getting back in school, <laughs> a benefit at this point. Uh, and we see that the top five schools in terms of with the highest percentage of students uh, opting in or families opting their students into in-person learning, all five of them, uh, Mount Greenwood, Ebinger, Burley, Mayor, and Wildwood, majority white, anywhere from 63 to 82%, excuse me, 83% white. Uh, and their opt-in rates go in from anywhere from almost 90% to, 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 to just under 80%. So 80 to 90% opt-in rates, those are the highest in the districts and in the district and every one of those schools with that 80 to 90% range is majority white. Now you take a look at the other end, uh, the schools, the five schools that have the lowest opt-in rate uh, and all five of them, Bond, Morton, Madero, and uh, Temple Chikali uh, are all, and, and excuse me, and Bright are all majority black or majority Hispanic. All are 98% or more black and Hispanic. Uh, and their range of opting in, it goes, are all under 10%, 9% to 3%. And so we see that in majority, in schools where the people that the district claims to be, uh, the, the people that the district claims to be concerned about uh, are not opt-in, have the lowest opt-in rates. And so you've probably heard that before. But the bigger part is, you know, because the district can always claim, hey, we, we're just making it available. We have no choice in, you know, the, the rate at which they opt-in. But for those who want to do it, you know, those black and brown folks who need it, we're making it available to them. The problem with that logic, however, is they did absolutely nothing, no kind of significant outreach to ensure that these people in these communities they claim to care about had access to the technology that they used to give people the choice to opt in. Like, think about this, Ben. They're saying that uh, black and brown families don't have the access to technology that, and because they don't have the access to, to technology for remote learning, we have to give them the option to opt in to in-person learning. And then how do they give them that option? <laughs> the internet, <laughs> right? It's an online survey. You had to have access to technology just to do the opt in. Right? And so they use the same inequitable, inequitably access um, avenue that they were complaining about that was leading these so-called inequities in, in, in instruction in terms of black and brown students perhaps falling behind. And then they use that same inequitable road to give them the, that same inequitable avenue to give them the option to opt back in and did absolutely almost no outreach. If you ask them about the outreach they, they did, they'll say, well, they had an online uh, <laughs> meeting, <laughs> and again, another online meeting where parents could come in and ask questions you know, and it give you a sense of what this looks like if people are serious. I talked to Dr. Kareem Watson at University of Illinois in Chicago. He's a medical doctor, and he has a bunch of different titles and responsibilities, but one of them is he's a part of the governing structure for five community health clinics. And we brought him in to do a panel on school reopening with a bunch of other medical professionals. And we said, look, if you're serious about inequities in relationship to health or school reopenings. What does that look like? What do you do that shows you're serious? And then he gave an example of what they did when COVID broke out. Those five health clinics had to stay open. He understood that although he is committed to equity, uh, racial and otherwise, that he is a part of a profession where you know, that there's a lack of trust between that many in that profession and the communities that they need to trust them, <laughs> that they need the communities that they want to continue to come into the clinics. And so he understood that I'm going to separate myself from being someone with good intentions and understand that people are not looking at me. They're looking at the institution I represent and oftentimes don't trust it. And so we have to do some significant outreach. They had, um, 
what they called uh, think tanks all throughout black and brown communities with over 600 different participants, giving them the chance to address and articulate their grievances, the things that create the lack of trust and the things that needed to happen in order for them to trust that these clinics will be safe for them to come into. 600 different people in communities throughout Chicago so that they can understand what kind of messaging and policies they need to create to create the kind of trust that would bring people back into the clinics. The CPS, CPS did absolutely nothing like that. No kind of, no kind of outreach whatsoever. Um, and so, but that's what you do when you're serious about giving people equitable access to the thing you claim to want them to have access to. And CPS did nothing of the sort. Janice Jackson didn't do it. Mayor Lori Lightfoot didn't do it. They didn't commit any resources to making it happen. Hey, here's an online survey. You want to come back or not? That's that's the gist of what they did. Beyond that, I mean, how do you explain the dramatic differences? And those are pretty uh, startling numbers. I ha I was not aware of that, Troy, until you said it. I, I just did not see those numbers. Uh, that Between the five schools, which are majority white, were uh, it's like a 90 percent or 80 to 90 percent uh, opt in rate of kids going back to the school compared to uh, the five schools, which are overwhelmingly black or uh, Hispanic, where it's <laughs> under 10 percent, 3 percent in some cases to 9 percent. What are some of the other explanations for that really shocking difference? Well, one of the um, issues that I didn't mention is that. Um, there are some schools where over 50% of parents didn't even complete the survey. 50% of parents didn't even complete the survey. That is insane. Um, and so again, uh, between the lack of technological access to the avenue through which they were giving people the option to opt in and the deep lack of trust that was created by the district's historic dishonesty, historic incompetence. This like, like it's, this, this lack of trust didn't just appear, right? Janice Jackson herself led the effort to shut down a, a, a level one plus highly ranked, well-regarded, majority black schools so that they could hand it over to a far less uh, black <laughs> and a far whiter community in the South Loop. You presided over that. Nobody's forgotten that. We know you don't care about us. We know you will do whatever inequitable, you will put your name behind any inequitable policy that those above you tell you to put your name behind. I don't know if you agree with them or not, but we know you put your name on and we're supposed to trust you? You know, and that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, there are numerous. And one of the things that folk need to understand is that the people who run the schools, right, were not involved in the reopening plan. The teachers were not involved in the reopening planning. There's a thing called design thinking, where if you're going to create a product, then you get the people who are going to use the product involved in the design of the product <laughs> so that you can uh, uh, you can actually tailor the product and fix bugs beforehand uh, things design flaws identify design flaws before you actually put the product out there it's the same thing with a product it's the same thing with a process right if you're trying to create a process and school reopening is a process you get the people who are in, who will be who will have to engage and utilize this process involved in the design of the process. That's that's basic. That is basic. Then, you know, even the NBA had enough sense to bring the players' union in in order to create the plan that led to the successful resumption of their season. Like, even they had enough sense to do that. But the C, the CPS bring principals in to the design process for creating a reopening plan, the people who actually have to implement the plans at a school level. Did they bring us in? Absolutely not. Did they bring teachers in? The people who have to implement it in the classroom? Absolutely not. And so you have all these people who are 
3,000 miles away from what actually is going to go down in schools, making these plans, and as a result, all kinds of flaws uh, have surfaced as a result when they hand these so-called plans to principals, and principals are like, there's no way we can make this happen. You need X, you need Y, and then they have question after question, and the response from the district is always, we'll get back to you on that. That's literal, that, those are literal comments from a principal survey that we did. In fact, I think your listeners might be interested in the results of that survey. Do we have a little time? Yes, sir. All right. And so we asked, there are about 1,100 principals. Uh, about 377 of them responded to this survey. So it's a very good sample size. Um, 33% of the population that you're sampling. I mean, when you, when you do, um, when they do these polls for president or mayor, often they get a sample size of less than 1%. <laughs> we have 33%, so it's a pretty good sample size. Mm -hmm. So we asked the question. Uh, we made a statement and then I have to say, do you agree or disagree? CPS has provided me with sufficient guidance and support on how to make reopening work successfully. CPS has provided me with sufficient guidance and support on how to make reopening work successfully. Tw less than 28% agree with that statement. 48.3% disagreed with it, and 24% couldn't decide either way. And so basically you have almost 75% who could not say that they had enough support and guidance to make this work successful. Mm -hmm. Next question, or next prompt. We have the staffing needed to reopen our schools safely. So this is all about staffing. Am I gonna have the people in place? Less than 22% agreed with that statement. 55% disagreed with it, and 24% didn't make a decision one way or another. So almost 80% could not say they had the staffing needed to reopen schools safely. Third, I am confident we will have enough protective supplies and equipment to keep our students safe. Now, this is the one area where, C where survey results are improving as we go along. It's still less than 50%, but uh, a few months ago, it was less than 20%. So right now, 43% believe, believe they'll have the protective equipment and supplies to keep folks safe. 23% couldn't decide either way. 34% said they do not. Uh, and so that one's been improving, but it's still abysmal. Uh, and perhaps the most eye-opening um, that sums up everything, given the resources and plans that we have, Opening schools for in-person instruction in January or February is the right decision. <laughs> Can I take a guess, Ben? Uh, well, let's see. Based on this, I would say, saying it's the right decision, 20% said yes. 16.5%. <laughs> well, I was a little off. I was within the margin of error, I think. You were uh, within the margin of error. Yeah, I would, I... Um, and plus or minus four, so you are within the margin of error, Ben. Yeah. 16.5 percent felt they had felt that, given the resources and plans that they have, opening schools in January and February is the right decision. 64 yeah. percent said absolutely not, and 19.4 percent could not decide either way. So you have over 80 percent who could not bring themselves to say that this was the right decision to, to that last case. go ahead to, to that last point let me just repeat i can't say this enough and i've said it all the time reopening the schools in the middle of a pandemic is so counter to the message that our leaders have been putting out for the last several months that you're really asking a lot of the people who have to go into those schools to follow them and so I'm a little astounded that 90% of the parents have opted in uh, at those schools on the Northwest and Southwest sides. Well, of course, that's also MAGA country uh, in relative to the city of Chicago, uh, where the disbelief in the, in the COVID would probably be higher to begin with. But Troy, this is the problem, the challenge that Lori Lightfoot and Janice Jackson had from the get go. They were, what they were asking people in Chicago to buy into was completely counter to what we've been told across the board since the pandemic. And they would say, but you gotta understand, they'd have all their specialists. The schools are safer than bars. Schools are safer than Thanksgiving dinners with your parents. Schools are safer than even grocery stores. They're about as safe as grocery stores. 
So, do you, you follow what I'm saying, Troy? You had a challenge on top of all the difficulties of getting old buildings uh, with lousy ventilation. Mm -hmm. And so that's the third aspect. I'm so glad you said that, Ben, because, you know, I talked about the existing lack of trust uh, and another issue. But the issue you just point out is that what you're asking us to do is contrary to the overall narrative that you're putting out there. And so when you add that to the mix, it's even more important that you bring people to the table to do this reopening process with you so that they can be there looking at the same information. Their representatives, at least, can be there looking at the same information you're looking at, mm. understanding how the decisions are being made, why these decisions are being made. But, it's the, 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 but these things are not happening. Like, even when we're in teacher education programs, and they say, uh, they're teaching us how to do class, uh, culture and climate in schools and classrooms. They say, the, don't just tell your kids the rules. Have your kids be involved in making the rules and then they'll buy, have more buy-in and actually living the rules out and enforcing the rules. They may even enforce the rules with each other if they are part of creating them. Right? That gives you the kind of buy-in and trust that you need. But again, they haven't done it. And I believe there's a reason why. I don't think they're serious about this. I think this is a political move. Uh, I sent you guys an audio clip um, of Janice Jackson in a behind the scenes meeting with principals. And she understood that principals were upset that not only were we not involved in reopening plan planning, we didn't even get any information about the plans until literally a couple of minutes before the press got the information. That is insane. And so understanding that she tried to explain why she did that. Do you have that, do you have that queued up? <laughs> do you have that queued up, D? All right, here First we go. First of all, uh, I think that we want, as always, to communicate uh, as early as possible with our stakeholders, um, uh, especially our partners who are leading our schools because you play such a pivotal role. Obviously, there are sometimes challenges embedded in that um, because we share information uh, ahead of time and hope that that information would, you know, remain um, confidential until it's appropriate to share. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes it's shared ahead of, you know, before we can get our message out. Um, and that kind of puts us at a disadvantage. That's it, right, Van? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's shared before we can get our message out. We would like to get information that you need to keep these kids safe. We would like to get this information to you in a timely manner. But however, we have another priority. What is that priority? Like, we have to get our messaging right. We want to get ahead on the messaging. And so when I, we weigh these two priorities against one another, getting you involved in the planning, getting you the information that you need to keep kids and staff and yourself safe, we've decided that's not quite as important as our need to spin our message to the press. That is what she just told us that spinning is more important than keep, keeping people safe, that the press is more important than students, that the press is more important than teachers, that the press is more important than principals. The press is more spinning their message. PR took priority over getting principals the information they needed to plan reopening as safely and effectively as possible. Yeah. And so when you look at that, the rest of this stuff, Makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's by the way, uh, that's that's Chicago. That, nothing ever changes in the city. I always say this, Troy. If you do the right thing, it's, that's the best spin of all. So it's like uh, Rahm Emanuel and Quan McDonald. He he buried the video. He figured, well, that's how I get reelected. I'll conceal the video from the public, and they won't know it. And because if I release the video, I won't get reelected. No. Had you done the right thing and released the video, you would have been reelected. You would have been credited for doing the right thing. So mm -hmm. instead of worrying about what message, what soundbite, you're going to get the Chicago Tribune editorial board to repeat, why don't you just bring in the <laughs> principals and teachers to win them over? Like the NBA did with Chris Paul, the head of the Players Association, before they opened up the bubble. Uh, all right, now, 
this 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 news story that's been breaking the last couple of days uh, is very revealing. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Try and see how widespread this. Is. There's articles in the paper, uh, teachers who have decided not to go back to the classroom, being locked out of access to their computers, so they can't do remote learning. Uh, and I, I know you're probably aware of this that's going on. You read the same newspapers I do and see the same stories. Uh, I, how widespread is this uh, in terms of what you're hearing from your uh, principals and members of your association and just your general reaction uh, to this policy? Um, I don't know how widespread it is, but I know it is certainly contradictory to the stated aim of making sure that these kids get their education. Like you just once again prioritize politics over equity. You prioritize politics over these kids because now the kids who are at home, which is most of them, you know, you were saying they're not getting in-person instruction and now you just created the policy where they're not getting shit or maybe they are getting shit, you know, from you. Um, it, it, it's cynical, it's abusive. Um, it is the complete opposite of the messaging they've been giving us so far, that they want these kids to have access to instruction because of what they might lose. What the fuck are they losing now? Because of you and your need to get back at teachers who don't agree with your politics, who don't agree, who don't trust you enough to put their lives in danger at a school. Yeah, you're gonna shut kids out of instruction so that you can get back at them. That's some dirty ass shit, man. It's dirty. I'm with you on that one. Uh, by the way, another point. All this talk uh, in Washington of unity, and I always smile when I hear, we'll get into Washington. I cannot let Troy leave this show today without getting his thoughts on an insurrection and impeachment. Uh, we'll get to that. But it's in Chicago, when it comes to mayors and the teachers, and now mayors and principals, it's never like a moment of unity. You know, Lori Leifert was elected. She didn't have the support, obviously, the Chicago Teachers Union. They went way in with Tony Preckwinkle. But in the aftermath, there was no unity talk between Lori Lightfoot and the Chicago Teachers Union. Lori didn't make any attempt to call in the SDG, Stacey Davis Gates, and say, come on, let's talk it out. Let's just work it out. It's always this adversarial relationship where we're the bosses and you're the employees and you do what we tell you. I, Troy, I've been seeing this in Chicago forever. Shut up and get in line and do what we tell you. And I think that's a large part of what's going down here. Your thoughts. Um, you know, my tone Unity is unity to, around what? Like unity is not like a goal in itself. Like you, it's unity to accomplish something. If there's no goal behind it, then unity is just a word. Um, and I could go all kinds of places on this. I'm so stuck on this national politics right now, but I'll try to bring it back local because I know we'll get there. Um, I remember seeing Jesse Sharkey at a board meeting. Um, after the strike and after everything was over. And his tone was shockingly like this sort of attempt at exactly what you're saying, or this sort of unifying language that I was shocked. Um, because when you know that your goal is one thing and their goal is another, you can certainly agree to have some, you know, amicable discussions and try to be respectful, but there's no unity to be had when you're heading in opposite directions. You have to get unity behind your goal and you have to unify as many people as possible behind what you're trying to accomplish. You can't unite with the people who are trying to accomplish the exact opposite thing that you're trying to accomplish. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Please for unity with people who are not heading in your direction. Either way, whether it's a Democrat, you know, I couldn't stand when Barack Obama, when, when Barack Obama did that stuff. I'm like, these people want you dead, man. These people want you to fail. What is this talk of unity? I don't understand it. 
Yeah, you need to be attacking these people, <laughs> not complimenting them, because they're damn sure going to attack you, and that attack has a purpose. Right? That attack is going to be heard by others. It's part of your messaging in order to build your base up, in order to convince those people who are in the middle of the road that the Republicans are not the way to go. And I'll say more about them later. I don't want to just haul off on these bastards right now. <laughs> but again, it's the same logic on the local level. Um, I, again, you got to be respectful when, 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 when it's not necessary to be disrespectful, because I certainly, I certainly think disrespect, I, I don't think, again, what's happening, anybody who had any part in what happened naturally deserves any fucking respect right now. I think they need to be blasted disrespectfully, respectfully, it doesn't matter. But um, you certainly can try and have the right tone, uh, but still be on the attack, because the other side is certainly going to be attacking you. Uh, by the way, I think what you were saying is that Jesse was trying to be accommodating. Uh, I remember when he when the strike ended, and he was being very trying his best to be accommodating. Uh, all right, uh, let's make the pivot to national politics. We talk a lot uh, with Troy about national politics. Oh my God, I don't even know where to start, uh, Troy. There was the insurrection, there was the impeachment, uh, and there was attempts, various attempts by Republicans to try to find some kind of narrative. You know, talk about a PR narrative to like either justify the insurrection or minimize the insurrection uh, in order that they could uh, slip out of holding anybody accountable mm -hmm. for went, what went down. And that goes from Donald Trump, who incited it, uh, to MAGA, who participated. Your general thoughts on all this? Well, the narrative that they went to was um, avoiding some talking about it and going to talk about, you know, this free speech rights on Twitter. <laughs> right? That's their narrative now. That's all the hell you see them talking about. Uh, they've done two things. They've tried to uh, marry what happened at the Capitol with Black Lives um, and try to say, you know, oh, now you're against riots. You weren't against riots when um, Black people were getting shot by police and damaged some property here and a few of them damaged property. They're trying to marry those two. That's part of their narrative. Mm -hmm. So that's basically forget about what to, to, to put the scope of the public's ire on something else other than what happened at the Capitol. And, and the other thing is to get people upset about their free speech rights, you know, and to Republicans are really good at this. Ron was really good at this. Janet Jackson's really good at this. They change your argument to their argument, and then they argue against their argument as if it's your argument. And their argument is always a much weaker, ridiculous argument than your real argument. They do it quite well. And it's like Democrats haven't figured it out. They don't even know how to call it out. They don't even have to call it what it is, you know? And so, you know, they'll be like, like with this, this, with this national piece, um, you know, people have been taken off, their social media accounts have been uh, taken away because they committed insurrection, right? But the way the right is spinning is that they're being taken away because of their conservative speech, right? <laughs> right? It, it's an attack on conservative speech. Right? Like, no, it's not an attack on conservative speech. It's an attack on speech that promotes insurrection, right? It's an attack on false speech that leads to insurrection. Now, in a way, they're kind of right, because false speech that leads to insurrection is pretty much what conservative speech is <laughs> these days. Yeah. Um, and so that's my observation. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Sometimes I just go off. Man. <laughs> Give me some other examples. This is good, uh, you know, where they take your argument, they twist it around. Uh, and reduce it to... <laughs> it's everything they do. I can't even think of it. It's like, it's ubiquitous. Like, you turn on Fox News right now, and one out of every two arguments they make, you'll see that happening. Yeah. Where they will take uh, something that the Democrats are saying or did or arguing for and turn it into a different argument that's their argument, and then um, rebut their stupid <laughs> argument that they just replaced. 
you know, well, I can't think of one right. It's all right, it was yeah. so much, man. That's all the right, argument let, of the day. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's let, let's uh, get it really specific. And uh, I urge everybody not now, but later, uh, check out the interview I did with Troy over the summer. Uh, it's, it's, it was it was a good one, if I must say so myself. Uh, if I must pat myself on the back and Troy on the back, and he was talking about this was in June, and you had been arrested, uh, part of a group uh, that was protesting outside of uh, Trump Tower. Trump Tower. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we don't have to re- tell the whole story again. I urge every again everybody to check out that interview. Uh, if this was right after George Floyd's murder and all right. the uh, unrest. And uh, <laughs> I just think about the tactics that were employed by the police officers against people crossing that bridge, Wabash Bridge, approaching Trump Tower, to the tactics employed uh, in Washington when the protesters, uh, protesters, I shouldn't use that, when MAGA, the marauders, descended the upon. Members. Yeah, the, the cult the members. members. Cult members, the Trump yeah. cult. Yeah, the Trump cult the descended on. Insurrectionist, seditious cult members. Yes. <laughs> Let's call them the sedition cult. I like that. Yeah, sedition cult. So talk about that. Talk about, like, so now they say, oh, well, you lefties weren't complaining when uh, Troy and his bunch were trying to ransack Trump Tower, but now you're worried about uh, our MAGA supporters ransacking the Capitol. Talk about that, uh, Troy, the, the connection, the, the equivalency they tried to make between what went down in Chicago outside of Trump Tower and what went down uh, in Washington. So what happened in Chicago was where people, for the most part, trying to cross the bridge <laughs> and chant in front of Trump Tower. Uh, and they had a police force there that responded in full force, keeping people out of Trump Town. I mean, they, they succeeded. They pushed, they had the horses, they had everything. They arrested us before, we, they arrested us before we even got to Trump Tower. Before even before we could have the opportunity, no, I'm pretty certain no one wanted to go in. Maybe there's a few people in the crowd that maybe have wanted to go in. I don't know, but folks just wanted to protest in front of Trump Tower. That's why I went. They didn't even give us a chance to get there. Arrested us with the idea that maybe we might want to get into this into Trump Tower, or maybe they just don't want the scene of these people in front of Trump Tower. What I do know is that the city's law enforcement. I need a new name for law enforcement because that's not quite what they do. Uh, the police force stopped us dead in our track with a massive amount of force. And I saw the exact opposite. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say the exact opposite. There were certainly some policemen there trying to hold folks back. Um, but they, the, 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 the nation, the city, the Capitol Police Force certainly did not bring the manpower to the table that was necessary to get the job accomplished. And many of the people who did come to the table did not want to do the job. And as a result, we got what we got. We got insurrection, we got people killed, um, and we have what it looks like law uh, legislators who were a part of the plan, who actually facilitated the breach of the Capitol. I don't even know I don't know what comparison. I can't. I can't even think of a point of a comparison to rebuff. There is none for me. Um, what I what I can can say about this, however, is that I said before. And I may have even said it on your show. I know I put it out on social media um, right after the election, but before the insurrection. And I said quite clear that the most dangerous force in the world today is the Republican Party. Uh, that Al Qaeda and its wildest dreams could not have accomplished what the Republican Party and Donald Trump have accomplished in terms of the erosion of Americans, American people's faith in their own democracy. Uh, ISIS in their wildest dreams could not have accomplished what the Republican Party has accomplished in terms of the political instability in the United States today. 
that the Republican Party has been able to accomplish as they've aided and abetted their leader. Um, Russia, I would say Russia, but I almost feel like Russia, Trump, and the Republican Party are all one thing right now. That I said it before the insurrection, and the insurrection is the outcome or the outgrowth or the logical conclusion of that fact. Mm -hmm. um, I think anyone could have seen it coming if they were watching. And it's easy to say that now, but I said it then. And we see it now. And what I can say again right now, Democrats are doing the same BS, man. Maybe. They're not calling this. Democrats are doing the same BS. They're not calling this what it is. You know, can you imagine how Republicans would jump on Democrats? In terms of the messaging and the, the treachery and just pouncing upon the opportunity to turn public opinion uh, against anything having to do with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Democrats need to understand that, right, right? And they would do it in a way that was false, <laughs> in a way that wasn't true. Right now, the Republicans are the most dangerous force on earth, and the Democrats aren't using this as the opportunity to make that truth known. You know, they're focused on Trump. Every now and then, they'll say something about one of his enablers in Congress, but they are not using this to get the message out that the Republican Party is the most dangerous force for freedom, for democracy, for liberty on earth. Well, they are moving forward with impeachment. You must give them credit for that. No, <laughs> I'm not giving them credit for that. Like, that's an obvious. For me, that's an obvious one. Like, you need to change hearts and minds. I don't know if impeachment is going to do that if your messaging that goes along with it is not as strong and concise and consistent and relentless as it needs to be uh, against these traitors, against these fascists, against these white supremacists. Um, they're just not doing it. You know, yeah, they're getting up and they're impeaching Trump. Um, but they're not turning this as and framing it as what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the Republican Party. These traitors are the Republican Party. This instability, this disrespect for law and order is the Republican Party. That's what they are. You know, when the Republicans try and say this stuff about Democrats, it's always something, it's always a hypothetical. This is what will happen. This is what would happen under socialism or under this. This is what the Republicans just did. Like, this is the absence of law and order. This is what it looks like. And Republicans did this. You know, I haven't spent time really fine tuning the messaging, but damn, <laughs> let's all come together. The think tank. I mean, the, the Democrats, you got hundreds of millions of dollars to do this kind of work, make it happen. Yeah. And then unleash it. Uh, unleash that messaging consistently and relentlessly um, against these debased, treacherous politicians. Yeah. And you talk about changing hearts and minds. Do you think it's possible to change the hearts and minds of, I don't know what the portion is, let's say it's 40% of America that is in the Trump cult? You of them, maybe. But, you know, we need a majority. We need we, One, you need a majority. And two, you need a passionate, a sub, a sub part of that majority to be passionate. Um, and, like, that's how you build power, you know. Where there's people, there's power. You know, it ain't always good power, as we can see. Because <laughs> Trump had people. We got to have people passionate people. And part of that comes with the messaging. And so it's not just about turning them. It's about energizing your own people. Uh, and you can they be turned? Some, absolutely not. Some, absolutely yes. Uh, but the point is to get the messaging out there. Uh, and then back to the school system. You know, all this stuff about, and this, I guess this will take the whole interview 360 degrees, man. All this stuff about getting kids back in schools and learning loss. Hell, man. We had learning loss when schools were open, right? 
the crap we see on a national level where people cannot tell truth, don't have the basic tools to tell truth from fiction, shows that there's been learning loss in schools for the last 50 years. There's, there's learning. When CPS comes back into session, this focus on standardized testing and the school rating system that um, incentivizes you as a principal or a teacher to teach to very specific and narrow reading and mathematic goals and not teach and not focus a massive amount of energy on teaching young people about civic engagement and how to tell and give them some basic tools to be able to uh, tell, have processes to tell truth from fiction where they can understand the reliability or the validity of information that's being presented to them, giving them those kinds of tools. That hasn't been happening in Chicago public schools. It wasn't happening before the pandemic. It's not happening during remote learning, and it won't be happening when they come back in person. We need to take this as a time to completely reevaluate what learning means, because there's going to continue to be learning loss in Chicago public schools as long as we have the backward test-focused priorities that we have. Mm. All right. Uh, to that point, two things. We'll close it down with two two things. One, well, we'll start uh, with this with the local one, then we'll end with Biden. Uh, I've had, uh, I like to point out, I appreciate the fact that Lori Lightfoot uh, is articulating her concern uh, for uh, the inequities that plague our system, uh, the inequities that make, make it such a disadvantage for poor kids in, in contrast to their wealthier peers. So I appreciate the fact that she's, uh, championing that as an issue. I point out that she's doing it in the in the context of a labor struggle with the Chicago Teachers Union, in my humble opinion. This is mostly about uh, defeating and crushing the Chicago Teachers Union. But let's give her the benefit of the doubt, Troy, and say when the pandemic is over, when the vaccines have been uh, widely distributed so that it's safe to go back to school without a shred of doubt, uh, what would you like, Lori Lightfoot, and her appointees at the public schools of Chicago to do, to continue their mission to eradicate inequities. Not just something they do when they're trying to force teachers to go back to the classroom, but something they could do going forth to show that they really do believe that these inequities uh, should be battled. Go ahead. So there's a story, and I can't remember the guy's name, Anthony DeMello. He was a priest or monk. And there's a story about him asking his student uh, this question. Um, if you want to know the truth, what's the number one thing you have to have? If you want the truth, what is the number one thing you have to have? And the student was like, oh, a passionate desire for it. And he kept guessing, he kept getting it wrong. And he finally like, well, what is this thing that I have to have if I want the truth? And the guy responds, you have to have an unremitting readiness to admit that you don't have it. And that, to admit that you might be wrong. You can't find the truth if you think you already have it, Ben. Because if you think you have it, you won't look for it. And I think that that's the number one thing that we need from all of our public officials, particularly Lori Lightfoot because she seems to operate in the school context is if she thinks she has the truth. If she thinks, you know, the fact, when you think you have the truth, you don't invite principals and teachers to the table to plan. When you know you don't have it, you bring folks together so that you'll be more than likely to get it at the table so that truth will come out, what you need, the realities, um, insights and perspectives that you don't have and that no one in, your, in the mayor's office has. Like when you do like, this is more about, cause your question is almost like a goals question. And I'm thinking more, uh, uh, I'm thinking toward the same goals, but I'm thinking of, you have to have a process to get to those goals. And so I think that's number one, you have to have, you got to bring design thinking into politics, into decision-making and bringing the right people to the table, being open and transparent, um, in terms of your planning practices and how decision making gets made, I don't realize that you can't do that all the time, but you can certainly be a lot better than you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, if that's the case, then 
the policies, uh, a better education system are more likely to result from those kinds of processes. So process, that's the process answer. The product answer is, you know, our schools are, are, are immeasurably understaffed. Right? And that has to be dealt with. And let me know if I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm not, you wanted your question to go somewhere. No, it's, uh, that was a very pragmatic, now you're heading, uh, yes, a very pragmatic uh, response that uh, a, a mayor can make to dealing with inequities. Staffing, yes. Mm -hmm. Hire more teachers, hire more librarians, hire more nurses, et cetera, and so forth. That's right. And if you care about inequities, then there was inequities, again, the, like, the learning loss issue I talked about in terms of people's ability to be intelligent decision makers has to get addressed. You have to change the priorities away from this test-taking BS and to creating engaged, civic-minded citizens and the kind of curriculum and practices that emphasize um, that. And then the other thing is, in just terms of resource inequities that already exist in the system, if I'm at Walter Payton or Northside or one of these other schools, I, as a student, have access to a massive amount, a massive amount of advanced curriculum, arts, music, not just music, but they're like 50 subcategories within music I can suggest. I can learn to play the cello. I'm just, like, you know what I'm saying? Where if, if I'm in a school on the, on the South Side, that you, on these schools that you say you care about, that you say, you know, I don't even have a music class in some instance, let alone the ability to learn to play an instrument, to sing in a chorus, or not just a chorus, but 10 different uh choral performance groups that will improve my artistic ability if that's the yeah. route that I choose. Well, if I'm on one of these South Side schools or West Side schools, I don't even have music in many places. I got gym. That's what I got. I got gym. Right? So if you care about equity, let's look at the inequities that exist between schools and start getting resources so that I don't have to fill out an application and go through some lottery just to get to a school where my kid has some decent educational option and uh, curricular options to choose from. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you on that point. And finally, we'll Biden. Two specific staffing curriculum. Uh, we'll close with Biden. We talked so much about Trump, uh, the exiting president. Uh, there's a president coming into office, and I know you and I will be talking in the uh, upcoming year, I'm sure, many times, mm -hmm. what Biden's doing. Uh, but what would you like to see from Joe Biden? Well, if you remember, I got to remind you, Ben, when I was when I was pushing, you know, when, when the primaries were going and you asked me who my candidates were, and, you know, I did not pick the two most progressive. I picked the two I thought could defeat Donald Trump. Yes. The first one was Bernie Sanders. And the second one was, do you recall? No, I do not remember. I've asked this question. So many people came on the show. I, I'm flunking my own quiz. <laughs> Joe Biden. Joe B. Okay. I swear that's where you were going. Surprised. You were very surprised that I yeah. picked Joe. And I was like, man, I don't have time to be ideological right now. Ben, yeah. <laughs> I just need Trump out and I need someone who can defeat him to be the Democratic nominee. And there are only two people on that ticket that I'm certain could be Donald Trump, yeah. Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. And Joe Biden certainly um, um, did not make a liar out of me. Yeah. Um, now with that said, I like the same, I mean, the same thing I just talked about as a local level, the national incentives. Like there was a national incentive that led to this testing BS. Yeah. Right. At this focus on there's a national incentive that was put in place. I think it was even under Obama to let to this focus on teacher evaluation. Mm -hmm. Like, if you just get in there and evaluate the hell out of teachers, don't support them. Just keep rating them and giving them grades. Right. And so there has to be national incentives put on the table because there were funding incentives that like, if you couldn't get money, if your state didn't pass a law to evaluate teachers 50 times a year, I'm yeah. exaggerating, you couldn't get. Uh, national money if you didn't have a system in place that focused on standardized testing that directed so much of public school energy into these narrow educational outcomes mm. that have led to the kind of crap we see at a national level where people can't tell truth from fiction, but they can get a high score on a reading test. Um, so 
national incentives that one, I would think, focus on identifying local out of school factors. You know, because this principal at Blaine, and I was a principal on the South Side, and I was a principal in the wealthiest and poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. I was an administrator, back to back. And I saw that my kids who came in in kindergarten at one school were years behind my kids who came in at kindergarten at another. And so the deficit <laughs> in what they had learned or their performance on these exams existed long before they got to a school. And so I like to see a national administer, a national policies that encourage local that states and local municipalities and school districts to focus on addressing the things outside of school that lead to such inequitable outcomes when, once kids get inside mm -hmm. schools. And then again, uh, national policies that focus us on civics rather than on civics and, become, and creating good citizens rather than policies that focus on scores on standardized tests uh, in two subject areas, reading and math. I think we need to get away from that. And I think a good national policy tied to funding, well-designed, could take us in that direction. Those are just two examples. Well, uh, that would be uh, Joe Biden acting like a real Democrat. And I hope for the same thing uh, on both of those fronts, but just on, on across the board. Uh, don't try what you're what you're what you're saying uh, in, is that the Democrats for so long try to like accommodate Republicans or accommodate Republican thought. And so, yes, a voluntarily, willingly, they came up with those those cockamamie things like prove to us before you get your money that you have you're going to be tough on teachers. And we still see that mentality, Troy. That's what's at the heart of what's going on right now in Chicago. Prove to us. It's like corporate Chicago and Civic Chicago says to Lori Lightfoot, prove to us that you're going to be tough on those dastardly teachers, and then we'll support you. And Lori Lightfoot's like, I, I'm with you already. I'm. Mm -hmm. So Democrats act like Democrats going into 2021 20, uh, would be a nice thing to see. But remember, part of why Democrats folded to so much Republican BS is because Republican messaging was so strong, so consistent, so ever-present that it began to have an effect on the people. Yes, it did. And if the Democrats wanted the votes of the people, then, then they had to start capitulating yes. to this message that the people had bought into. Yeah, so absolutely. You have to, it gets back to my other point. Yeah. You have to be the strongest messenger. Absolutely. And the equivalent, we'll close with this because we've gone overboard uh, too long, but the equivalent to what Democrats did with education policy would be as though Democrats in the face of Donald Trump saying over and over again that he won an election that he obviously lost. If Democrats were to finally say, you know what, we got to make a concession to Donald Trump. So we're going to agree to have a commission to look into these non-existent uh, non-existent allegations, evidence of fraud. Do you follow what I'm saying? That would be the equivalent. At least they haven't done that yet. Do you get what I'm saying? Donald Trump, every day, that message was put out. There was fraud, there was fraud, there was fraud. And his uh, his emissaries in Congress, there was fraud, there was fraud, there was fraud. Fox TV, et cetera, and so forth. They repeated. At least the Democrats didn't buy into it, Troy. You get what I'm saying? They pushed back. They didn't do that in education, though. Do you follow me? So I'm following you. Yeah. Um, all right, Troy and Ravier, and uh, we're going to let you uh, get out without making you do any uh, songs, uh, hip hop, anything else. But we do have a request, Troy, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, we um, do. Yo, yo. Coming up next yeah. month is our two year anniversary oh, uh, yeah? for the podcast. Yeah. And what I've been doing is I'm trying to get, you know, the guests that come on, maybe, you know, like on the radio when you hear it, like, hey, uh, say, my name's Troy the Ravier, and you're listening to... Da -da -da -da. So if you could, you know, just give us a, a happy anniversary shout-out, and uh, I'll play it for an anniversary special. Would you mind doing that? Oh, hell no. I'll do it. All right, cool, cool. I'll just give you a countdown, and then, uh, yeah, okay. you just... So I'm saying... Um, happy an um, happy two-year anniversary to the Ben Jarofsky Show. Troy president of the Chicago Principal Association. Sure. Happy two-year anniversary to Ben at D-Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, hold on. He's got to give you the countdown, and then he can... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you just feel uh, free, and feel uh, free to... And it's the Ben Jarofsky Show, we're calling it, right? Yes, yes. sir. Yes, sir. Feel free to say All whatever right. you want. I'll give you the countdown. Cool. Okay, here we go. Three... Two, one, go. 
<laughs> this music. What the hell is this music? <laughs> it's, it's sincere. You're being sincere. All right, let's from the top. From the top. Let's go again. Three, two, one. Here we go. Hey, this is Troy Ravier from the Chicago. <laughs> okay. Uh, take two. <laughs> take two on that. We're looking for a sincere happy anniversary. Here we go. Three, two, one. Hey, this is Troy LaRavier, president of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association. I want to wish my main man, Ben Jarofsky and D Nice, a happy two year anniversary. Two years. The Ben Jarofsky show is to two more times 50. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. Uh, that was, that was oh, awesome. and uh, Joe Biden would like to thank you uh, for uh, his support in the election. Isn't that right, Joe? Play the radio. Make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. The, the, the phone, make sure the kids hear words. Whatever that meant. Whatever, man. He, he appreciates your support. Uh, have you seen uh, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? It's on Netflix. Have you seen it at the Netflix no, production? I see it every time I turn Netflix on, but I just haven't. Oh, you got to watch it. I've been watching it. But watching you go through that, it had to do a, a couple takes. Reminded me, there's a funny, a funny scene, and I don't want to give it away, uh, where <laughs> Ma Rainey's nephew, uh, she's insisting that her her nephew get to participate in the recording. Uh, anyway, when you watch it, you'll get what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Troy LaRabia, thank you very much. Right. Uh, as I hope, always. I hope I did justice. You did justice. Uh, we'll talk to you probably next month. All right, Troy? Oh, Dennis. Yeah. Um, I um, did a, um, um, I did an A camera, B camera for this interview. <laughs> okay. And I did my, and I got my own shotgun mic. All right. <laughs> so if you want the video or the audio, the audio is probably because it's the shotgun's right here. And it's probably real clear, so I don't know if you want yeah. to use it, but I no, for sure, it to yeah. You if you do, yeah, send All it right. my way. You got my email. All right, cool. All right, Thanks, very buddy. good. Take care, Troy. The great Troy Laravia. Hey, Do you get updates before we head out the door? That was a good interview with Troy. Always yes, good having was. Troy on. Uh, Troy's uh, one of my favorite. Everybody knows that. I got my favorites. Everybody knows that. I was going to ask him to stick around, but that was a long interview. I'm sure he had things to do. But Ben, we yeah. do have breaking news. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> the bottle way, gets me every time by the way this is the back half okay and seven months later a follow up the following comes from the Chicago Sun Times and Fran the woe man Spielman actually Ben I'm going to send you the link in Google meeting boom you can read the story right there look at us look at us we're doing well <laughs> Hold on. I'm very nervous now here. I don't know what to do. You sent me something. <laughs> well, I'm going to read the story. I'm going to read. I'm going to read. It's in the it's in the little chat thing on the side. You figure that out while I read this story. All right. Here I'll we go. It. Go ahead. The mm -hmm. headline reads CPD suspended 17 officers, supervisors who lounged in congressman's burglarized office. The Chicago Police Department has doled out suspension of up to 20 days against 17 Chicago police officers and supervisors accused of sleeping on a couch, popping popcorn, and drinking coffee in the burglarized office of U.S. Representative Bobby Rush at the same strip mall where looters had a field day last year. Yes, that's right, people. A follow-up on Popcorn Gate. <laughs> ben, do you have the link? Uh, no, okay. Where's, I have not, we'll no idea where we'll this figure link that is. out after show after show meeting. <laughs> I have no idea where the link is, and I know I have this this fear. If I could share this with you, ladies and gentlemen, it's called baby boomers panic. Any button I push will destroy the system. Baby, this is something that baby boomers yeah. deal with. Millennials are like, oh god. Something else about Malay. I know this is. We got to get to the important story. D. Have you ever noticed this? That millennials never listened to messages you leave on their phones. You ever notice that? It's like millennials are like, "Why are you leaving me a message, boomer?" <laughs> and I always forget that. I got called a millennial the other day. The name. We no need to uh, mention the name. And I forgot. D. I forgot. I momentarily forgot. You should never leave a message for a millennial. I think. Apple, from now on with your new phones, just take away the whole message things. Because millennials don't listen to them anyway. Sorry, D, I went yeah. on that tangent. Once again, <laughs> my co-host. And 
or my co-worker for the last four years, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the oldest it's, man in the radio. It's and the thing. Listen to messages. It's the thing that says chat in the top right corner. You All see right, where it on. says chat? The top right you. corner there? Yeah, there's me. Uh, hey. Show everyone. Chat with everyone? That thing? Yeah, it's that chat, and then it'll you'll see a link to the story. But anyway. There is no link. Okay. It's well, just a green just, button. Just listen to me, and then you riff on it like we always do. I can't see a thing. <laughs> Sorry to throw a, a wrench in the system there. Go ahead, man. Okay. Okay, please stop trying. Just listen. The Chicago Police Department has doled out suspensions of up to 20 days against 17 Chicago police officers and supervisors accused of sleeping on a couch, popping popcorn and drinking coffee in the burglarized office of U.S. Representative Bobby Rush at the same strip mall where looters had a field day last year. Yes, a follow-up on Popcorn Gate. Fraternal Order of Police President John Catanzara disclosed the punishment and said the union has filed grievances challenging all of those suspensions, which range from one day to 20 days. One suspended officer was punished for, quote, simply walking in and using the bathroom, Catanzara said. Catanzara also told the Sun-Times, quote, what do you want people to do when there was nothing going on? They had already secured the whole property. They had originally walked through the parking lot around the backside of all the buildings to make sure all the doors were secure when they arrived there. They came around the front. There was nothing going on. That was done. Period. Are they supposed to stand attention in the mall? All right. Uh, that's Johnny Catanzaro, the head of the Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, the article clearly does not uh, quote anybody from uh, the mayor's office to explain what the officers did. Am I correct? It's just Johnny Catanzaro's. He was on Fred Spielman's show, and so he was mentioning that some officers have been punished. Am I correct in that one, D? I believe so. Okay. Yes, I'm looking here. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, this is, yes, one of my uh, uh, one of our leftover topics from uh, 2020. And uh, just because Johnny Catanzaro says something does not mean it's not true. Now, I know uh, Johnny Catanzaro is not a very popular man on this show. I will not in a million years understand uh, his utter obsession with all things MAGA, his love for Donald Trump. Donald Trump has said absolutely nothing to make life better for police in the city of Chicago. He's done nothing in terms of providing more resources to help the police, money for cop cars, money for, I don't know, more equipment, whatever. Money for her to help with their pensions, money to help pay for, like if they wanna see a therapist, nothing. He's been worthless uh, to help in any measurable way police officers of uh, the city of Chicago. If anything, he's been a detriment because he's reinforced some of the worst attitudes that have been so prevalent uh, in law enforcement down through the years and how you deal with people in Chicago. You know, if you don't like them, bang them, knock them up, <laughs> rough them up a little bit. We all know what goes on in Chicago. So I will never understand uh, why uh, Mr. Catanzaro loves Donnie Trump so much, but he loves him. Loves the Donald Trump T-shirt, supports Trump every step of the way. And he got elected in part because he was more pro-Trump than his predecessor, Kevin Graham. We'll never understand why the Chicago uh, Federation of Police thinks it's a good idea in a city where 80 to 85 percent of the people vote against Trump to uh, have a leader who is solidly in Trump's corner. That said, he raises a good point. City of Chicago has never come forth with any kind of what? Report, analysis, whatever you want to call it, as to what went down with Popcorn Gate. What was the message that was coming through the chain of command when those police officers settled in on Congressman Bobby Rush's office just off the Dan Ryan uh, back in when it was uh, this summer? I've lost track of the day. It was a long time ago. They've never come out and said, were the police officers invited to go there? The police officers say they were invited to go in there. City has never come out with a report. It's just one of those, there's just so many of these things. City of Chicago doesn't want to discuss them. Does just wants to bury the information. And so in this particular case, I think he's got a legit, legitimate point. It's just like we just got finished talking with Troy Laravier. City of Chicago has never provided 
any kind of rationale for why all those police officers surrounded Trump Tower uh, in the days after George Floyd was murdered and just mass arrests of people who were trying to cross the bridge to uh, get to Trump Tower. Why? What was the strategy? What was the policing strategy? Why so much resources to, around Trump Tower as opposed to neighborhoods? You know, whose decision was that? Was it Lori Lightfoot's decision? Was she in charge? Or was it just the decision of people on the street? Lori Lightfoot was not in charge. Same thing with Popcorn Gate. Whose idea was it to ultimately let the police officers or tell the police officers they could go into Bobby Rush's office? Did Bobby Rush's office in any way sign on to that? Was there any evidence of that? Was there an email from somebody in Bobby Rush's office? I don't know. I don't know if this exists, but an investigation, D, where you want an informed public would reveal this. So I would like to see that. I would like to see um, what the city has uh, in regards to what went down with Popcorn Gate. But apparently they're ready to, uh, they must have, I, I, I shouldn't even say that. Apparently they're uh, going ahead with an effort to punish the police. So I would like to see whatever evidence they have. I was gonna say they must have some evidence. That's not always the case. <laughs> when the city, like Troy LaRVA was fired. I remember uh, Janice Jackson. He was fired uh, from Blaine School. Janice Jackson, the head of the Chicago Public Schools, came to the Blaine community and said, we have evidence. We, we just we can't share it with you now, but we will later. And they never shared it. So I would like to see what they got. I'd like to see, you know, I, I like you talk about being informed citizens. I like to be informed. And I think Candace Era, God, these words will come back to haunt me. I think he's got a good point here on this particular issue, Dean. All right. By the way, Popcorn Gate, number eight in our 10 Gates of Illinois Hell countdown. Go download it now. ChicagoReader.com and wherever else you download podcasts. The 10 Gates of Illinois Hell. All right. Uh, I have a few more quotes from Kat and Zara here, then we'll end it out. Uh, it, says, it says here on Thursday, Kat and Zara argued Lightfoot's motive was more selfish to deflect attention from her own failure to stop the bloodbath on Chicago streets. Kat and Zara said, quote, there was 22 people killed, I believe, killed in one day in June in the city of Chicago during the summer. Distract, distract, distract. Coffee and popcorn. Coffee and popcorn. Don't look at this. All right. Well, now he's <laughs> now Johnny's just. Driving off the, I mean, what? Oh, that's another whole issue. Just policing strategies in general. So, is it Lori Lightfoot's fault that there was murder in the city of Chicago? Is that what you're saying, Johnny? Is that what you're saying? That's it. I mean, uh, Johnny Canizero has been all over the map in terms of law and order. When it came to the insurrectionists, the marauders, the MAGA hat wearers, he was like, hey, what's the big deal, huh? Just a bunch of boys having fun. Come on. And then he sang. Remember, D, broken the boys just want to have fun. I heard he sang that on the Fran Spielman yeah, I'm show. still looking for that part of the, <laughs> the interview. Come on, Fran. I haven't heard they, that they, yet. They sang it together. Boys just want to have fun. Da -da 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 -da. So I, don't know. I mean, the guy's lost a lot of credibility as a, a champion of, quote, unquote, law and order. When he said, hey, what the hell is this? But you guys having fun, man. Come on. All of a sudden, he's, you know... Great scholar when it comes to figuring out the correct police. I, I don't know. I'll just tell John Katzer this. I'm older than him. So I just remember Chicago being a very violent city for years and years and years. And I remember Chicago dealing, uh, policing tough cops. Goes back to 1968. You want to start it? Well, it goes way back before that. Cops, hey. Hippie protesters, we'll show you how you deal. <laughs> we'll show you how we preserve, protect, law, the storm. <laughs> Didn't see any of that with MAGA, by the way. So it hasn't worked. All that lock them up, all that sweeps, just throw people in jail if they possess a joint. That hasn't worked. Maybe, a, I don't know, time to think about something new. You would hope that uh, the head of the Fraternal Order of Police 
would be part of the process of thinking of a new way, a new approach to law and order. So there you are, everybody. Remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and Benny J. Bonus interviews at the Chicago Reader website and wherever else you download your favorite podcast. More stuff than the 10 gates of Illinois hell, all right? Over 800 episodes for you to download. You can reach out to us always, Show at gmail.com, B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J show at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at Benny J Show, B E N N Y, the letter J Show. And we have a phone number. Yes, it is true. 708 658 4788. I said it wrong in the first hour. Someone, <laughs> I said the wrong, someone listened to the show is going to call the wrong number. But this one is right. 708 658 4788. Call the Ben Jarofsky Show. Leave us a message. And who knows? There's a good chance we will play it on the program. All right, I want to thank Troy LaRavier, outstanding job as always. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend, the pride of Joey Bolton, Illinois, without whom the show ain't possible. And as Troy will tell you, and as John Canizero will tell you, back home at home, they come white lightning. Give yourself a raise, take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Play the radio. Play the radio.